all telling basically the same story. So uh, I want to listen because each account is a little bit different. The first one is Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 through 13. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. <clears throat> In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And that was the Matthew account. Now we're going to look at Mark chapter 14, verses 3 through 9. And while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask, poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was this ointment wasted like this? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whatever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Now let's read the John account, John 12, 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. And then finally, the Luke account. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors, one owed five hundred denarii and the other fifty. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You've judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. 
In our country, possibly because of our Puritan roots, we are rather uncomfortable with extravagance, at least when it relates to displays of emotion or worship. With the exception of our demonstrations of love for our favorite sports teams, and we've seen that just recently here, haven't we? Did you see a big parade? We saw people dressed in all kinds of things, dancing, shouting. Um, some of these are probably typically buttoned up stockbrokers and stuff, but they weren't buttoned up the day of the parade, right? Um, we might wear clothing, jewelry, accessories, even paint our faces, but with the exception of sports teams, we tend to favor a more reserved display of our feelings. Sure, someone may do something crazy when they're proposing to the one they love or inviting them to homecoming or prom. You'll, you'll see those kinds of interesting things that people do. But after that, it typically settles down into more normal and acceptable means of expression. When we read a story like the one that we've read this morning, we don't really know where to put that. It can be pretty difficult for us to relate to because we can't imagine ourselves, I mean, let's be, let's be honest, we cannot imagine ourselves doing anything of the sort. I certainly can't. Um, one time I was in a training and the instructor had asked me to be a plant in the, in the class and it was a, a training on crisis prevention and uh, it was a section on fear and when something happens that causes fear everyone's first response and so he asked me on the break he said when I say these words I want you to scream as loud as you can well I was a nervous wreck preparing for that because I don't like to disrupt class <laughs> it's not my thing and um, so I prepared and I prepared and when he said the word, I screamed at the top of my lungs and I think I probably overdid it because I was so nervous, but some of the people that were in the class were cops and they were like turning and getting down on their knee and getting ready to come after somebody and um, other people were clutching their chests. I mean, it was, it was bad, but I was as anxious and my heart was beating as fast as anybody else's because I could not, it's not typical of me to have, show that kind of emotion or that kind of a, Spectacle. And so I can no more imagine myself doing what Mary does than I can imagine myself sprouting wings and flying over the, the gathering. Okay? Um, when we read a story like the one that we've read this morning, it's very, it's very difficult to relate to. But in order to enter the story, we need first to try to understand it in context. So one of the first issues with the story is is it one or two events? Okay? And we're not going to argue about that. This anointing is recorded in all four of the Gospels. And we know that each Gospel writer um, has a different purpose in writing. And so each one of them tells the story a little bit differently. Luke's account is strikingly different than the others. So um, in, in two of them, it was the home, well, three of them, it was the home of Simon. In one of them, Simon is identified as a leper and a Pharisee. And in one, we don't know whose home it was at, but we know Lazarus was present. So there are several different things along those lines. In one place, it's the woman is identified as Mary. In two of the others, it just says a woman. And in the last one, it says a woman who was a sinner. So I don't know that it was two things or not. It um, could be, but it, I don't know that it has to be. Um, because Mary, like everybody else, was a sinner. <laughs> Although that may not be what they meant by that. Also, I want to make sure we have a little bit of understanding of a couple other things in the story. Um, alabaster. What is it? Yeah, stone. It's a stone. Yeah, it's a mineral. Um, it's often carved into um, containers or into ornaments, and you can. You can look it up, and I, I did, and I thought about sending a picture that we could look, but I wasn't sure it would really tell us that much, but feel free. Um, it's a stone used for carving. Still used today. You can still purchase alabaster items, but in ancient times, it was used to make containers for precious things. Glass wasn't really made then, so containers usually were clay-based, and alabaster vessels were created to hold and conserve very expensive perfumes and ointments. Nard. When you read this story, it talks about pure nard. I'll be honest, that doesn't sound that great. It sounds too much like lard. <laughs> sounds like one of the things you put lard on your feet and 
doesn't sound good. So we don't really know what we're talking about. But what it actually is, is spikenard. Sounds a little better. It's an oil, a perfume or an ointment made from the spikenard plant. It was extremely expensive. A small jar such as what Mary would have used was worth a year's wages for a common laborer. So think about your easy. What you make in a year, if you're a regular person, and you're coming and you're going to break that, that jar and you're going to squander what you have. It's a big deal. It was very jealously conserved, usually. Certainly not something you would break on purpose and pour out. It was also very, very highly fragranced. I used to say just with Abu Dhabi, a little, uh, what was that, dipping do, I think, when I was a kid. But um, you don't need much. It goes a long ways. And she poured the whole thing out. And um, Luke's account, or John's, tells us that the fragrance of it filled the whole house. Okay? This oil was so highly scented that Jesus himself would have continued to have the scent on him for several days after she did this. And those several days after this event actually encompassed the cross. And it is very possible, very probable, that there may still have been some slight aroma of Mary's gift of worship that Jesus could catch traces of even as he suffered. And the first time I had a sermon, heard a sermon talking about that, it just it just blew my mind. And it talked about what would you see here, sense of the cross, and also what would you smell. And it talked about the spike and it would have still been evident because it was so highly fragranced. And that's a beautiful thing that even as Jesus suffered, it's very probable that he could still smell that gift of worship. I don't know how important it is to be sure whether it's one event or two. To me, there's not a big conflict in the accounts. All of the things that are said in Luke's account could have taken place in the other accounts as well. Remember that each writer had a purpose for writing, so they would each emphasize different aspects of any story they told. It seems odd that something like this would have happened twice, but it's possible. It also seems odd that the host in both of the events would have been named Simon, but again, it was a common name, and it's possible. In Bible study, you do want to analyze those details to, um, to come to the best understanding you can of a passage, but we don't want to overanalyze and miss the point of these stories. So, one or two accounts either way. We're at a dinner. Two of the accounts say it was at the home of Simon the leper. One says it was a Pharisee named Simon, and one says it was at the house where Lazarus was. Obviously, Simon the leper no longer had leprosy. How do I know that? He couldn't be sharing a meal with people. Okay, so was this someone that Jesus had healed? It's possible. It might even be probable. A thank you dinner would not be um, would not come amiss under that circumstance. Could he be the same Simon the as Simon the Pharisee? I think he could. Pharisees could certainly get leprosy just like anybody else. In Luke's account, where the man is named as a Pharisee, there is much more focus on the contrast between the woman's offering and Simon's hospitality. That's what Luke was focused on. As we've discussed before, it was customary for hosts to have their guests' feet washed. People were walking around in sandals or barefoot, were, roads were dusty. This was apparently something Simon, whoever he was, hadn't bothered to do um, for Jesus. Another thing we know is that women did not sit at the table with men. In John's account, we learned that Martha was serving at the dinner. Mary's actions then, she wouldn't have been sitting at the table. These were totally unacceptable in her culture. She comes into the room where the men are reclining at table, like the pictures you see of the Roman banquets and stuff. You see all the men lolled out at the table. That's where she walks in the room where that's happening. And Mary is carrying an alabaster box or flask full of spikenard. Tremendously expensive. Some postulate it might even have been her dowry. Possibly. Her gift cost her something. It wasn't a gift that cost her nothing. It cost her in other ways as well. A woman's hair was her glory. It was to be kept covered unless she was alone with her husband. So here Mary comes into this room where all the men are, goes straight to the guest of honor, and she does unthinkable things. She lets down her hair. She weeps. She touches him. She wipes 
his feet with her hair. Mark tells us she breaks the jar. I love that image. What difference does it make that the jar is broken? <clears throat> no way back. She's not holding anything back. You can't put it back in. You can't say, okay, I've given enough. Oh, can't get to stay in the jar. She's holding nothing back. Some people might say, well, she's making a show of herself, but I don't think that that's true, and I know Jesus didn't think so. Um, I don't believe anyone in that room existed for Mary in that moment except Jesus. You've heard the expression, I only have eyes for you. It's not normally true, but I think it was for, for her. I think that's the way it was. She gives Jesus the best that she has, extravagantly, wastefully, some people said, and she weeps. Why? Maybe it's for gra the gratitude for the forgiveness she's received. Maybe it's gratitude for raising Lazarus from the dead. Perhaps she, this is the same Mary, at least the one that's identified in the one account. It's the same Mary who used to sit at Jesus' feet when he would talk. Perhaps she'd been listening. Maybe she had heard him when he spoke of going to Jerusalem and dying. She caught some flack, as intense lovers of Jesus always do. Three of the accounts mention how the disciples fussed about her wastefulness. The other discusses her sinfulness and goes on to say Jesus must not have been much of a prophet to let such a woman touch him. Whether it's one instance or two, Jesus addresses what they're saying to themselves. Three of the authors say that he mentions that she is the only one who has prepared him for burial. In Luke's account, Jesus provides a lesson for the Pharisee on forgiveness. The one who is forgiven much, loves much. In all the accounts, the woman's gift of love, adoration, and care is received by Jesus. He doesn't say, there, there, a little less over the top. Thanks, but, you know, he doesn't do that. He receives it. And in fact, he says that wherever the gospel is preached, what this woman has been told, has done, will be told. And I think that's beautiful, too. This story is the only one of Jesus' interactions with people that is in all four Gospels. So I believe that his words had an impact. In the presence of Jesus, lovers will always have extravagant displays of worship. The one who's been forgiven much and knows it can't help it. He can't help it. In our Sunday school class, we have talked about King David and his extravagant display. Please look with me in 2 Samuel chapter... I lost my chapter. Um, it's the story, it begins in verse 12 of whatever chapter it is. Um, the Ark of the Covenant had been away from Jerusalem for a long time, it had been captured by the Philistines, and it had been making its way back. So David went and brought up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the Ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod, which is an undergarment. So I don't think David was doing the electric slide and the careful choreography um, or some program dance. He stripped down his undergarment and he's dancing with all his might. This does not sound decorous. It doesn't sound programmed or planned or prepared. Leaping and dancing is what verse 16 says. A few verses later, we learn that David's wife, Michael, had been seeing this. She'd been watching out of the window of the palace and she had not been favorably impressed. She who had once loved him says, beginning at verse 20, you can hear the sarcastic tone. How the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So she's, she's not saying, hey, nice job dancing, buddy. She's saying, good grief, aren't you embarrassed? You should be embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. That's what she's saying. And David says something rather fabulous in verses 21 and 22. It was before the Lord who chose me above your father. Kind of a bazinga, right? It was before the Lord 
who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this. There's one version of the Bible that says, I will get more undignified than this before the Lord. David's love and worship so eclipsed his love for Michael, who he did love, that a challenge to it was no contest. Selfish Michael, who wanted David's love to herself and to her prestige, she lost it that day. Faced with a choice between contributing to Michael's sense of what was due her and unbridled celebration before the Lord, there's no question what David would choose. In spite of his many sins, God called him a man after his own heart. Now certainly some of these expressions had more meaning in the culture where they occurred, but there is something for us here. We have talked in our Experience in God class about God pursuing a love relationship with us that's real and personal. And I've seen you, and I too, have been trying to come to grips with this, with what it means. We've discussed how those who love God obey Him. And I think we're all trying to work that out. I think that there is also this aspect of expressing our love to God. I'm pretty sure that most of us here are not going to dance before the Lord with all our might. Although if God moves you to do that, I hope you will. We can't wash Jesus' feet. Physically, he's not here. But we should seek the most extravagant displays of love that we can through our art, through our words, through our service, and our worship. Um, Hebrews 13, 15 talks about bringing the sacrifice of praise, which I interpret as praising on the days when life is not good. Praising God in the midst of terrible circumstances at times, sacrificing with fruit of lips that sacrifice praise to him. Like Mary or the woman, our love and worship for Christ should cost us something. Mary brought the most precious thing she owned, and she risked sacrificing her reputation and being embarrassed in front of everyone. David risked his dignity in front of all Israel. This was the king leaping and dancing in his skivvy. This is an amazing, amazing thing. And so we want to look at what are we called to do to express our love to Christ. Um, today we're going to be celebrating birthdays of two people who have been doing that for many years by giving their talents and their time to the Lord. Um, about three weeks ago in Sunday school, Janet said something that I thought was just beautiful. She said, the older I get, the higher I want to lift my hands. That was amazing. And I hope for each one of us that we get to that point. Um, I, I never sing on a day that I'm preaching, but one of the songs I like to sing is, I cannot lift my hands that high. All that I know is I must try, because you lifted up your hands to God. I have to, in worship, do those things. So I don't know what you're called to do to express your love to Christ. To obey Him, I do know that. To follow Him, and not be afraid to step, kneel, or dance out of your comfort zone. We have been forgiven much. We don't want to be like Simon who didn't get it. The one who's been forgiven much loves much. Let us love much in return. Turn in your hymnals to number five.